Hello and welcome to the InfoQ Podcast. My name is Wes Rice and I'm your host. In addition to hosting the InfoQ Podcast, I also chair the QCon and QCon AI software conferences. QCon AI is in April 15th and the 17th in the Bay Area. If you're a software engineer trying to better understand what Andrew Ying calls the new electricity, QCon AI is the conference for you. It's all about traditional software engineers building AI-enabled tooling to better respond to outages, sys development, and just generally remove friction in software development. Check us out at qcon.ai to see the full schedule. Today on the podcast, we're talking to Brian Cantrell. Brian is perhaps most well-known for D-Trace. He's an incredibly dynamic speaker. So Brian joined Sun in 1996, where he worked on Solaris, perhaps best well-known, as I said, for D-Trace, the non-invasive real-time tracing and troubleshooting tool developed originally for Solaris, now available everywhere just about, for Fishworks, which was a stealth project within Sun to produce the Sun Storage 700 Unified Storage System. After Sun, he moved to Oracle, where he then left in 2010 to become VP of Engineering at Joint. Today, he's now the CTO. Today on the podcast, we're talking about Rust. We'll try to understand why Brian, a longtime C and C++ developer, enjoys the language so much. We'll spend some time on things like memory, type, and concurrency safety. We'll talk about ownership. We'll talk about things like why Brian feels we shouldn't remove too much friction in software development. Finally, we'll apply Rust to the operating system and why Brian feels it's time to start rewriting at least parts of the operating system in Rust. This talk builds on a talk he has online called It's Time to Rebuild the Operating System in Rust. You can find that talk on the InfoQ YouTube channel. As always, thank you for bringing us along on your jogs, walks, and commutes. Brian, welcome to the InfoQ podcast. Thanks for having me. So I can literally still remember this Solaris 10 course that I took when I was the portal administrator for the Java Enterprise Server Portal Server for the U.S. Army about D-Trace. I specifically remember the D-Trace bit and it blew me away. So thank you for that. Oh, you bet. It was fun. So I want to talk a little bit, kick us off kind of with the backstory of D-Trace. What brought up D-Trace? Well, I mean, I just think my frustration with not understanding what software was doing. On the one hand, it was so long ago. First kind of initial ideation around D-Trace was when I was an undergraduate in 1995. And yet, even in 1995, it felt like the stack of abstraction was so deep that I just didn't understand what was happening. And it was very hard to reason about software from first principles. And that was a much simpler time. I mean, you look at now, things are much more complicated. And software has this problem that when it's actually running, you can't actually see it. And that was frustrating to me. And in particular, I didn't understand why we weren't using dynamic program text modification to instrument running systems. And that was what debuggers have used for a long time. I mean, debuggers have mechanisms for the way you set a breakpoint or when you set a breakpoint, you are changing the program text to trap into the operating system. The program stops, you go over to the debugger, you, you know, print out whatever state you want or what have you via an interactive interface. And when you run the thing, it then will single step past the stopped instruction and then run it. And I didn't understand why we just didn't do something much more intelligent, use a similar kind of technology, but allow things to run effectively where they would record some amount of state, but not otherwise stop the process or, or run a kernel. So I'd wanted to do that for a long time, or I had originally kind of thought about that as an undergraduate. And you know, for me, a, a really important moment in my career was when I came out to interview for Sun. Uh, and I actually came out to interview for Sun somewhat reluctantly. I really wanted to work for a computer company which in 1996, on the one hand, there were more computer companies. On the other hand, every computer company was busy mortgaging its future to Windows, which I was not really interested in. I honor the fact that he's you know, curing tuberculosis or whatever, but Bill Gates still robbed me of my childhood by depriving me of the memory management unit. I'm sorry. I can't get past it. I know it's a hang up. I apologize for it. I think he's done laudable work for humanity. And it's probably more than made up for the fact that we didn't have a protected mode operating system for all the 80s, but I'm not sure. Now you say that, and I think I read something that D-Trace is now available on Windows or a version of D-Trace. D-Trace is available on Windows. This is true. So how does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. It gives me complicated feelings. I, I, I don't know what I feel <laughs> because generally, I'm very positive, right? I think it's great. It's great for Windows. You know, Windows itself has long since become a modern operating system. 
And there's actually a lot of interesting technology being developed at Microsoft. It does actually almost physically pain me to say that. But I think on the one hand, it should just be unequivocally great. On the other hand, yeah, there is something a little bit weird about it. <laughs> but it's great. I mean, it is great. And I'm glad that you know it's the power of open source software that they were able to take the technology and bring it to Windows and bring it to hopefully a larger group of people, because that's ultimately what it's all about. Microsoft is one of those stories of a company that's really remade itself. It's just not the same company of the 90s. But let's I want to go back to Sun. Tell me more about this first interview with Sun. I didn't realize the history of D-Trace went back that far. My experiences with Sun had been pretty mixed up until meeting the engineers I was interviewing with in the Solaris Performance Group, in particular Jeff Bonwick. And meeting Jeff was just like, you know, a bolt of lightning in that he had a very energetic person who saw things as I did. And most importantly, you know, I've been kind of asking people why something like D-Trace didn't exist. Because it seemed, I mean, obvious is too strong, but I just didn't understand why it didn't exist. And what I had been told by someone who I felt, who I looked to as an expert, he said, you know what? There must be some reason it can't be done, because if it could be done, it would be done by now, which on the one hand is a reasonable thing to think and say. On the other hand, it's an incredibly unreasonable thing to think and say, because it implies that we've invented everything that can be invented, which is obviously wrong. It's the way we kill all new ideas, right? So yeah, if someone would have already done it already. If someone would have already done it already. And you know, sometimes really great ideas can start with these really basic questions. And going back to questions that people haven't thought to ask or re-ask. So when I came out to Sun to interview, my question to Jeff was not, is this possible? But why haven't you guys done this? There must be some thing that I don't understand about the microprocessor. There must be something that makes this impossible. And what I remember was, of course, Jeff's reaction, which is like, yeah, that seems like that should work. I was like, oh, okay. And then he said, you should come out here and do that. And I was like, all right, yeah, I guess I will. And that was just very empowering. And, you know, I, I have tried to take that with me through my entire career that a, you know, a 21 or 22 year old has the power to have an idea that can be really important and they should be encouraged to pursue those ideas. That's a huge kind of first lesson, first principle to learn as a young software engineer. And I mean, and honestly, even if the ideas don't bear fruit, the process can be incredibly important and educational. It's all about the journey, right? Journey, right. Speaking of journey, so there's a gap here. I'm looking at my notes. You started at Sun in 1996, I think, and then D-Trace was somewhere around early 2000s, at least when I got exposed to it. So did it take a while to get started? Did What, what were you doing in that kind of meantime? I mean, kind of ironically, so I came out to Sun in 1996. And with D-Trace in mind, but, you know, there was too much to be done to start work on D-Trace. And, you know, it's too much to be debugged in the system, debugging the system a lot. I'm a strong believer in debugging, which sounds like a stupid thing to say. It's like I'm a strong believer in, you know, like healthy living or whatever. Air. Air, exactly. Like I'm, I'm pro air. But debugging is a great way of learning about a system. And it's a great way of contributing to an engineering team in a way that it's kind of not blocked on you. So you spent that time debugging Solaris, debugging the system? I really spent debugging the system. Okay. And I guess as a result, getting deep inside in that system, right? And as a result, learning a lot about the system and just getting a visceral feel for what I wanted D-Trace to do. And we started referring to D-Trace as if it already existed, which was a very annoying thing to do. So someone would have a problem and we would say, you know, actually... D-Trace would solve this problem. And they're like, wait a minute. It didn't exist. <laughs> but D-Trace doesn't exist, right? I'm like, no, it doesn't exist. But I'm saying, like, if it existed, it would solve this problem. It's like, yeah. Could you please go implement it then and shut up? It's one of those things where you have to have the marketing before you actually have the power to push for it. Yeah. Well, and I think it does actually show that I think even when you've got a big and important idea, sometimes you want to take an indirect approach to get there in that you want to really understand the problem space. And the five years between coming to Sun and starting work on D-Trace was a very important five years for me. It laid a lot of foundation. And by the time we went to go work on D-Trace, I was not naive. And I knew exactly what I was looking for. I knew what I wanted. And I knew what we could do to deliver some early results. And that's the other thing that was really important with D-Trace is that we started delivering results pretty quickly in that we we were able to do things that you couldn't do previously. And, you know, it was fun to be able to turn on the first spotlight 
really, in the system because you discover all sorts of behavior that people did not know existed. Think of the number of courses that I've had since that time frame, and that particular one still stands out in my mind. I still remember the aha moment when I first saw Dietrich. Which is honestly, it's great. You know, it's great to have been part of that aha moment, and it's fun to have developed a technology that took so many hardened technologists by surprise in terms of they didn't know that it was possible. I had one customer say, if I had known that this is possible, I would have been demanding it a long time ago. <laughs> of course. So, which is great, you know, and I still seek to do that. I still seek to be a part of teams that are willing to do things that people don't necessarily think are possible. And it's obviously, sometimes you're going to fall short of the mark, or sometimes you're going to learn along the way that the problem is a lot harder than you thought it was. But I still really believe in those big, bold swings. And when they connect, they deliver such incredible value. So speaking of big, bold swings and of asking questions, the talk that you did at QCon San Francisco back in November was, is it time to rewrite the operating system in Rust? As I mentioned in the intro, you're an awesome speaker. It was an awesome delivery, but why Rust? Why abandon those C++ roots and go to this newfangled language Rust? I have hit a hot button on that talk. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> that talk, have you seen it? That talk has been up for, they put it up on YouTube. And it's been up for like, I don't know, two weeks or something like that. It's got 60,000 views, which is a lot of views. But they've left YouTube comments on, which is not necessarily a good idea. And I know like, I know, like you should – all right, look, fine. You should never read the comments. I mean even my 14-year-old is like, dad, what are you doing reading the comments? That's a, that's a terrible idea. And then he'd be like, oh, dad, you got to upvote this guy. This guy's your homie. That talk, for whatever reason, gets people riled up. And I'm not sure why, because I try to be somewhat circumspect about it. I'm definitely not saying that, hey, we should you know, throw out stuff that works and rewrite them in Rust. But I do think that Rust is really interesting, and it's a really interesting development. To me, it is the biggest development in the creation of system software in my career. And my career postdates C and C++. So we have not had a big language breakthrough. Honestly, to the point that I have probably like a lot of systems people somewhat cynical about what a programming language can actually deliver because we have had to accept this trade-off that when a programming language delivers more to you, it takes it from you in the runtime. Wait, I want to digest that. We've had to accept this trade-off that when a programming language delivers something to you, it takes it away from you in the runtime. Okay. You know, garbage collection being kind of the classic example of that, where it's like the programming language is going to give you the ability to kind of use memory dynamically without thinking how that memory is restored to the system, but then it's going to exact this horrible, horrible runtime cost in garbage collection. Which is not to say that GCs aren't, you know, really cleverly implemented or that there aren't, you know, some great implementations out there or what have you. It's just that the problem that it presents is endemic, namely that you have this performance pathology that you can't can't get away from where memory consumption will become CPU utilization effectively. And memory leaks, which even in a GC language, you can absolutely positively have resource exhaustion due to memory use. Those things will manifest themselves in really painful, ugly deaths where instead of just dying cleanly with out of memory errors, the system will work harder and harder and harder to try to find garbage that doesn't exist. And you then have this subset of your service that has become this tar pit. And anything that touches it is going to see these ridiculous outlying kind of latency, and then you get amdolled and the system kind of cascades. So I need to break up with GC-based languages. I need, kind of need to be done with them for higher level services. Uh, and they certainly are inappropriate for the operating system. I think people have kind of played around off and on over the years about having a, the operating system kernel written in a GC language. But that's insane. That's just not going to work. I've always felt it was insane. It was insane at Sun back in the day, you know, when it was Java everything. Sun was so Java centric that we ate in a cafe called Java Java. Of course. Why wouldn't you? Oh my God, if you were not a Java person, which I obviously wasn't, it was like, all right, can we at least like eat in a neutral location? Like, am I, am I, like, do I mean, I, like, if we had had a cafe called Solaris Solaris, I don't think the Java people would be into it, okay? I mean, you have seafood. Come on, give them a break. It had to be Java Java. <laughs> I'd had to, I guess it had to be Java Java. I have found myself at kind of a, a, a bit of a crossroads where I'm sick of GC languages. I'm also mindful of the fact that C is a pain in the ass for a lot of modern upstack software, especially. You know, it is a pain in the ass to parse things in C. It's a pain in the ass to deal with strings in C, which is not to say that it's definitely not impossible, obviously. 
in some cases, it's not even difficult. Okay, it may not be difficult, but it sure is tedious. It is often tedious. It does require a specialized skill set. And then the other problem is C just doesn't compose very well. I mean, that's actually, in many ways, the biggest problem is that you can't just pull a library off of the internet effectively and necessarily use it because everyone's C is laden with so many idiosyncrasies around how that's used and in particular, the contract around how memory is used. If I call your function, do you allocate the structure for me and pass it back? If so, under what conditions do I free it? Do I pass it to another function to free? And you know, we have worked our way around this stuff with really strong convention and really strong discipline around the way we write libraries, we being kind of my tribe of C programmers. And, you know, my tribe doesn't necessarily, it transcends, you know, operating system and company. And I know when I am in the code written by one of my tribe, because it's clean C code, it's well commented, structures have prefixes, function names all have the same prefix, they all have a kind of noun, underbar, verb kind of structure to them. But the reality is that that's not most C code. The tribe is small. And for most things, even most basic things, I find that you are having to rewrite a bunch of stuff from scratch. So you kind of touched on ownership there and part of that is really the attractiveness of Rust that it's this higher level language with these concepts of like ownership? Yes. The attraction of Rust is that the ownership model is actually novel. And it is ownership and the absence of GC that allows you to actually address this composability problem that we've historically had with C. So I'm a Java developer. Break down ownership for me for a minute. So ownership is effectively statically tracking who owns the structure. So statically in the compiler tracking who owns the structure such that it can determine that when a structure is no longer in use and it can be statically freed. So you are getting some of the, or or much of, all of, the power of a garbage collected language. But there is no garbage collection in that you don't have to scan the heap looking for free memory because the system itself, the compiler is so rigorous around ownership in particular that it knows when things are no longer used and it will explicitly free them. So those frees exist in line. So earlier you said when a programming language delivers something to you, it takes it away from you in the runtime. The opposite is sort of true here with ownership, right? There are some side effects that you have to learn to deal with, and you don't have the support of a GC language to help you, right? In order for Rust to do this really incredible thing for you, it's going to constrain how things are used. And that, I think, is the hang-up that people have, is that they hit those constraints. They don't understand why those constraints exist, only that the compiler is barking at them for things that they don't understand, and they get frustrated. But from my perspective, and I think this is where it helps to be a C programmer, honestly, coming to Rust, because you know when you are implementing in C, if you are coming from assembly, you can understand the underlying assembly that that C is going to generate. And similarly, when you are somewhat paradoxically, I guess, when you are implementing in Rust, you can feel the underlying C that that Rust is trying to implement. And so when the compiler is complaining because it's confused about who actually owns something, and so it doesn't know what to do, you understand why it's complaining. And it can still be frustrating. And historically, there have been times where you've had to kind of jump through hoops to make it clear to the compiler what was happening. The compiler's gotten a lot smarter recently with non-lexical lifetimes. There's something you actually said in your talk that kind of resonated with me. And it was something, I'm not going to quote it correctly, but it was something along the lines that nobody cares about the design time experience with a system level programming language. All that we really care about is the runtime performance. That's right. It's kind of like, that's what you're giving up with Rust, or like the intimidating bit with Rust, at least for me. Me, it's that learning curve of jumping into Rust. It's like, yeah, I want to work on it, but there's a huge curve to it, no? There is a curve to it, certainly. I found that to be less acute than I expected. Now, it may be that I was just expecting something that was so acute and so foreign. Were you prepared for it? I, yeah, maybe I was just like braced for impact. And it was like, all right, well, this is actually is not that bad. It is true that Rust has got a slightly higher or higher early cognitive load. I found, and maybe it just like matched my intuition for what was going on, 
I just found it to be not that bad. Now, that said, I am far from a Rust expert. And certainly when you go to look at some of these really creative creates, especially things that are using like procedural macros, there's definitely some rocket science there. So I don't want to imply that you kind of get quick mastery of all of Rust. But I would say it's slightly different than some other languages where you very quickly understand the entire language. And then you find that sophisticated things require you to do really kind of nasty things with like, let's say like the preprocessor in C, right? Where the preprocessor is actually absolutely essential to C. If you were to take away the preprocessor, you would really undermine the development of C. So C is not just C. C is also C and CPP. And CPP is actually a totally different program. Obviously, they get implemented in a single compiler today, but it has historically been an entirely different program. And you need to kind of understand that in order to effectively write C. So you have this kind of this long tail. And I think with Rust, you are absorbing more of that load up front. But then at least what I found is that I got really fluid with it quickly. And I found that I could come back to Rust code I'd written a while ago and still understand what was going on, which, you know, it it feels like a low bar. But, you know, I think in this day and age, it is easy to have, you know, a lot of context and write some code, then come back to be like, oh, please, what was I thinking here? You know, I know I wrote this and I've got absolutely no idea what was going on. We talked about ownership and got some memory there. There's also type safety, concurrency safety, things like that when we talk about languages. It's a type language, but what's the type safety story with Rust? Yeah, I mean, it's very strongly typed. As a result, Rust gets very persnickety about things. You know, one of the things that I actually love, it's safety. I mean, people talk about the memory safety, but I love its overflow safety. So it's really easy, especially in C, to have integer overflow. And integer overflow often leads to memory safety issues, not of the kind that you're likely to see in kind of the natural order of things, but of the type that's likely to be exploited by an attacker. So a classic way to exploit a C program is to convince it to do its bounds check incorrectly if it overflows in the bounds check effectively, and then dereferences arbitrary memory. And you as the attacker can then sculpt what is dereferenced. And Rust makes that damn near impossible because it is very good about determining how you're using unsigned versus signed types and preventing that kind of overflow or sign extension or what have you. So I have found, and especially after years of being, well, from C and then, but in JavaScript, you know, I think that with JavaScript is just call it type unsafe is almost to understate it. I mean, JavaScript is like gunplay from a type perspective in that it is so easy to have a typo that you don't catch until the code is actually running, which is really problematic. And obviously the popularity of TypeScript and so on shows that people are ready for much more strongly typed JavaScript. Or at least a layer on top of it that you can opt out if you don't want it, right? Right, exactly. I found that it's such a relief to be back to really strong typing. And I think that strong typing to me, and I, maybe my position on this has changed over the years, in that I like the fact now that strong typing throws that cognitive load back onto the developer. I actually am wary of making software development too easy in that I think it's a mistake to allow developers to develop code that they don't understand. No, you a wizard, Trent. Right? Well, yeah. And so I think we have kind of enshrined this idea of developer velocity, a term which I hate, by the way. It implies that a developer is like a projectile. But we've enshrined this idea that it should be really fast to develop software, even if that software then has failure modes in production that are really nasty to debug. And when I look back on my career, I have spent more of my time debugging software than writing software. And I've spent more of my time debugging the software of others. And I think that there's like a karmic, I don't know if that's a debt or a surplus that I'm running, but I think that there is actually something to having the developers of the world slow down a little bit and actually have more of that cognitive load in development. And maybe the artifacts that we get into production then don't need to be as debugged as much. Okay, so I have a question about that. And it's all around kind of this idea of velocity versus friction. So Netflix talks about this idea of the paved road. And I'm sure you know, but this is that idea that if you use their stack and libraries that are kind of most common for the enterprise, it gives you things like support for alerting, tracing, logging. It gives you language support for the microservices that you're working on that kind of embed circuit breakers and bulkheads. It helps you bootstrap. 
It does things like secrets management, CICD, and even things like dark canaries that let you test that logic with a subset of traffic and production. So if you follow this paved road, you gain a huge amount of benefits that kind of reduce that friction. So there's definitely value in removing friction from that developer experience, right? There totally is. And so I think the art is you definitely want people to not have the job be reduced to tedium. You don't want people resolving the same problems over and over again. You want composability. You want abstractions. What you don't want is where you have removed so much friction where you can develop code that is riddled with hidden problems. So you're really talking about understandability of what you write. Again, back to that comment I made earlier from the pragmatic programmer, no evil wizards, developing code through levels of abstraction that you really don't understand. That you don't understand. It slows developers down to force them to run Lint on their C or JS Lint on their JavaScript. Right, That is not going to make anyone faster, but that's going to result in better artifacts. And what Rust effectively does is it takes a lot of that checking and that falls out of the model that Rust has from a memory management perspective and from a type safety perspective. It's just harder to get yourself in the trouble with Rust. And I also find that once you're ramped up on it, then you actually are able to write it quickly. You know, you kind of develop a pretty quick intuition for where the borrow checker is going to bark at you. And then because you do have much better composability, you are able to get on that paved road really quickly. I think that once you have ramped on Rust, you know, my belief is that you are going to actually be able to develop quickly and correctly. And this is the regard in which Rust is really delivering the dream to system software programmers. Everybody I've talked to that has worked with Rust has said it had a little bit of a learning curve, but once they got past that learning curve, they really loved the whole experience and they, they wouldn't go back. Yeah. And I would say the learning curve is not that bad. I would echo all of that. And then I would say that what it boils down to is there are some big bargains that Rust makes that you need to understand. You have to understand the ownership model to understand Rust. I mean, frankly, for JavaScript, you need to understand closures. I mean, I always thought that JavaScript should be taught with a closure-centric approach, where on day one, you're explaining a closure. Assuming this is not day one as a programmer, but day one as a JavaScript programmer, you need to understand closures and the binding rules and so on. Because if you don't, you're just going to be confused about the actual behavior. And with Rust, you absolutely have to understand the ownership model. But if you spend the time, and I, I just think actually what it boils down to is, when people say the learning curve is steep, Rust does need to be learned. It, it can't just be kind of beaten into existence. And I think that we as programmers, you know, especially once you've been doing this for a decade or two or three, you haven't really had to do what you did when you first came to computer science and programming and sit down with a book and learn a new thing. And with Rust, that's what you need to do. And it's not that bad, but it does require us to go learn it. So we talked about memory, we talked about type safety. What about concurrency? What's the story there? Honestly, I've done very little with concurrent Rust. I have actually, my Rust code has all been single-threaded, I'm embarrassed to say. But I will tell you that just from the way the ownership model works, it lends itself very well to concurrency. In fact, I find when I'm writing single-threaded Rust code, it is lighting up the multi-threaded parts of my brain in terms of the way I think of the problem. Because when you are borrowing memory, you can kind of think of a function that you're calling as another thread that you are actually handing control off to, even though it's definitely not it mentally has that same feel to it. So you can see how naturally that model lends itself very, very, very well when you actually want to go have that true parallel execution because the compiler knows these two memory objects are not being used by these two threads in parallel because I know this memory object is only being used in this scope over here. And that allows for pretty transparent parallel execution well, I haven't done it yet, certainly anticipate doing it. You can see how that would lead to a real revolution in multi code programming. So one more question that I want to shift into what this means for the operating system and even defining what operating system means. You did that a little bit in your talk, and I want to talk a bit more about that. But before we go there, I want to talk about unsafe and what it means. Like Rust is safe, but it's also unsafe. What does that mean? Well, yes. Yeah, so Rust allows for unsafe operation, and it actually does it very explicitly. There's an unsafe keyword, actually. I have not found it in, in to be needed really in pure Rust code. But there are times when, for example, if you've got Rust code that is handed a body of memory that it needs to operate upon, the way that memory kind of gets into Rust 
lost, you're going to need to wrap that in an unsafe operation. And this is generally used or should be generally used by those who are developing the abstractions that can be more broadly used. Because to make those efficient, you often do want them to do effectively direct pointer manipulation that is then done very carefully and scoped in an unsafe block where Rust will basically say like, okay, I'm going to trust that you know what you're doing. The nice thing about that is that still that allows you to get that performance trade-off. That is to say, the the fact that you can very selectively turn off Rust's borrow checker and and ownership checking allows for you to actually do some things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise, but you do them in a very limited scope. And so then you can have a composable abstraction like a vector or what have you, which can then be used everywhere. And you can know that I've very carefully audited these small number of unsafe bits. People shouldn't be using unsafe in their code in general. And I think that if you are using unsafe routinely, that's a problem. It's a problem in the way one is implementing Rust, or it's a problem Rust may not be the right fit for that job. Okay, let's riff on that for just a minute. I just heard you say that a lot of unsafe usage maybe is a smell that you've hit a use case that this is an area that maybe Rust isn't the best language to kind of solve this this use case with. What are some of the areas that maybe Rust isn't the best tool in systems development? I do think that Rust struggles because the ownership model is so central to Rust. Rust really struggles when you have data structures that are multiply owned or data objects that are multiply owned. So let's say anytime you've got something that, you know, think of it in Java and C, any object that you have that is pointed to by more than one thing where in that kind of a model, Rust is really going to struggle because it doesn't know who owns this thing, so it won't let you do that. And unfortunately, a very common structure, namely a doubly linked list, a doubly linked list is actually two singly linked lists that have multiple ownership of each node, right? Because each node is actually on two lists at once, one pointing one way, one pointing the other way. And when people really feel the pain of Rust is when they go to implement that doubly linked list. And Rust really doesn't want you to do that. And you want to resist the temptation to kind of, oh, I can just do that with unsafe operations. It's like, no, no, you don't want to do that. You want to really take a step back, think about the problem you're trying to solve, and try to take a Rust approach to it. Not because Rust is being dogmatic about whether doubly linked lists are useful or not, because they are useful, but more because Rust wants to be able to give you this very important power. Namely, I'm going to give you the power of a garbage collected language without garbage collection. but I need you to avoid these kinds of data structures that make it really difficult for me to do that. And there are ways to do it in Rust. It's just that they're very complicated. We've been talking about Rust for a bit and apply this to this idea of rewriting the operating system. But before we do that, I want to define what we mean when we start talking about operating system. As you talk about it in your talk, it's software that's an abstraction of hardware that's an abstraction of software. Something along those lines is what you said. But when we're talking about the operating system in today's world where we've got 2,500 nodes that are out there running in this microservice world, when we're talking about an operating system, what do we actually mean? What do you mean? Well, you've got a lot of layers, right? First of all, we talk about user level in general. We mean operating at the unprivileged levels of the microprocessor versus kernel level, which is operating in supervisor mode or ring zero or the privileged mode of the microprocessor. So when you're executing in the operating system kernel, you can do anything on the hardware when you're executing at user level, you can't. Now, there are asterisks all over that because when you are executing in ring zero on virtual hardware, you have to put that in air quotes because you're not actually in ring zero. You are in a virtualized ring zero that's been created by the hardware. And there's actually a hypervisor underneath you that is using the microprocessor support for virtual hardware to construct that virtual ring zero. But you're actually executing in a context that is effectively a user level context for that underlying hypervisor. So you'd be like, okay, so the hypervisor is the operating system. It's like, well, then there's actually a couple of rings below the hypervisor. First of all, on, on x86, there's something called SMM, system management mode, which is a very scary mode for anyone that does OS development because it's a mode that the microprocessor can go into for essentially at any time for any reason. It can stay there as long as it wants and do whatever it wants. And any OS kernel developer does not like this at all. Because the idea that the microprocessor can just disappear for a while and then come back to the OS kernel or the hypervisor is very disorienting, to say the least. So in SMM mode, there is unseen software that is executing underneath effectively the hypervisor. There is then software underneath SMM mode 
underneath SMM. There's the Intel Management Engine, the ME. And the ME runs in, again, somewhat loosely specified contexts with software that is yet deeper in the system. So there's all these different layers, each of which thinks that they control the machine or control the virtual machine. What of them are the OS? Not sure it hugely matters. All of them are an operating system at some level. What I hear you describe is a massive monolith. Are we building operating systems wrong? Or do we need to decompose the monolith into more specialized units? It's not a monolith so much as it is a layer cake. And each of these abstractions was invented for a potentially good reason or a putatively good reason. But what we are left with is an extremely complicated layer cake that can operate at cross purposes to itself. And we've certainly seen that with Spectre and Meltdown where you have, and the security researchers have honestly been terrific in terms of explaining to people what the layer cake looks like and actually being able to see down the layer cake. Now, in their case, it's for purposes of exploiting the system, but it's very educational in terms of what's actually going on underneath you. I don't think we're necessarily doing them wrong, although I do think that we have a scary amount of software that runs underneath us for almost arbitrary us. And I think, especially for that kind of unseen software, it is very important that we bring a discipline to it. It's scary to me when that software is written, say, in C or in assembly. That software, not just in the operating system, but beneath it in the management engine or SMM or the BMC or other kind of unseen parts of the machine running firmware, I desperately want to see that firmware being written in a type safe language. And I think Rust is a great fit for it. One of the conclusions of my talk was that firmware is a great spot, I think, for growing Rust development. And one of the beauties of Rust is that outside, it just looks like C code, right? So you can write Rust and begin to insert pieces to the operating system without having to tear apart the whole thing, right? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I really like about it is because it doesn't have a runtime, the actual objects that you get from the Rust compiler are relatively simple in that they're traditional objects that devoid of runtime that can simply take control of execution and execute and be done. And as a result, you can integrate Rust into C and C into Rust. And by being able to integrate it in C, you can kind of effectively integrate it into many different kinds of environments. So it's potentially, I think, a very good fit for a lot of things in that you can take a kind of iterative approach where, say, in the operating system, you can actually potentially write a device driver in Rust and have a system at large that is in C. And as I pointed out in that talk, take a similar approach to what we took when we went to structured programming languages and away from assembly, where we slowly rewrote parts of the system in C that were in assembly. But in every operating system, there are important chunks that are still in assembly. And I think that every operating system will have important chunks that are in assembly and important chunks that are in C. And I think we will see growing elements that are in Rust. I don't know that we will rewrite the entire operating systems in Rust, but I do think we will see growing elements in Rust. So are we going to see D-Trace in Rust? Yeah. You know, I actually thought about it. You know what would be interesting is I would not – I mean, you could do the internal component in Rust. It would be – I think you would end up with so much unsafe operation that it would kind of undermine the value. One thing that you could definitely do, though, is the user-level component. There's a libd trace that actually consumes the results of internal D-Trace. That could definitely be written in Rust. And then the utility, D-Trace utility, could absolutely be written. I think that actually the some of the earliest, easiest places to integrate Rust into the operating system are in the OS utilities and libraries. So I think we can begin to spread down that way. And I view the system libraries as part of the operating system. The operating system is not just the kernel to me. It includes those system libraries. Well, Brian, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us on the InfoQ podcast. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me.